Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Orthopedic Grand Rounds in July. Today's a very special morning. We have uh, some of our researchers demonstrate what I think are breakthrough insights into bone physiology. Um, we want to dedicate this particular session to our past dear friend, Paul Benke. Dr. Benke was a leader in our community, very much respected. We're very honored to have his son, Eric Benke, a recent graduate from Mercer Island High School here. We all hope that you know how much we loved and appreciated your father. We very much hope that you might be interested in orthopedics or bone physiology based upon your visit here today. We have a very special congratulations um, uh, to one of our residents. We're very proud of that. And with this, I'd like to ask our medical director, Dr. Tom Steger, and our executive director, uh, Mrs. Yenovitz, to come up to the podium here. Thank you, Jens. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning to present an award to one of the residents here, our Teaching Leadership and Caring Award. Uh, as some of you know, we started this uh, several years ago to recognize those among us who are exhibiting what we feel are the, the best of our professionalism behaviors. And, and we get letters from a wide variety of patients, families, sometimes from staff members, and, and uh, each quarter select a couple of those to bestow an award uh, upon that individual. And so I'm delighted today to be able to give an award to Dr. Jennifer Hagen. And Jennifer, if you can come on up. So I have the letter here from uh, one of our staff members uh, who writes, Dr. Hagen first met us in the emergency room on the evening my mother fell and broke her hip and then cared for my mother throughout her surgical experience under the supervision of Dr. Seth Leopold. I can tell you most sincerely that I was thoroughly impressed with Dr. Hagen's abilities. She was always a bright spot in the day when she came to see my mother. She certainly is an exceptional physician and deserves praise for her fine work. Not a single follow-up item was omitted. She filled us in the entire way and made the process as straightforward as possible. I could tell that she worked very well with Dr. Leopold. As an employee at UWMC, I was impressed by her clinical skills, but most importantly by her wonderful bedside manner. Dr. Hagen's warmth, compassion, sincerity, and great sense of humor were quite exceptional and supportive. On behalf of my entire family, please accept our appreciation for the exemplary care provided by Dr. Hagen. We are delighted to see the excellent progress my mother is making as she rehabilitates, and we know that a large part of this improvement is due to the superl superlative orthopedic care she received at UW Medical Center. So, Dr. Hagen, congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much. We have a certificate suitable for framing oh, for you. Good. Thank you. <laughs> and we have a speci special stethoscope, <laughs> which I'm sure will come in very handy in your yes. orthopedic work. Yes. <laughs> it has a reflex hammer with it, right? <laughs> we'll track one of those down um, just, just to help you remember this award. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. And Dr. Zinowitz, our executive director, has a few words for you as well. Thank you. Thank Actually, you I'm not a physician, but I'll take the uh, compliment. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Congratulations, Jennifer. Um, our residents are our future, and it is always so exciting every time that we present this award to one of our residents or fellows in training because you are our future. On behalf of my executive team at the University of Washington Medical Center and our board, I want to thank you and congratulate you on a job well done. Uh, we appreciate everything that you do every day, and especially when the recognition comes from our patients and their families, uh, it is, uh, makes it very, very special. Thank you. Thank you. We're blessed with an excellent resident corps. Um, we're also blessed with a fantastic group of researchers. It's with particular pride that I want to introduce you to some of our very fine researchers who are really gaining some very interesting new insights into bone physiology. As orthopedic surgeons, we grow up with a little bit of a stigma that bone cells are kind of not particularly sophisticated. They're more or less like an innate object. They're there to be used, but not to be cared for. Uh, in fact, a lot of diseases reverberate around significant problems uh, with bone physiology that are not solved at all. And it's with great pride that I introduce uh, Dr. Peter Kavanaugh, our vice chair of research, um, as the leader of a group of our researchers who have uh, really made some significant strides in understanding bone physiology better. Peter, good morning. Good morning, Vince. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be able to introduce this Grand Rounds. As with any clinical department, we have strengths in uh, clinical care, which is where you hear what you hear most of during these Grand Rounds presentations. We also have tremendous strength in research, and we have a strong educational mission, as you have just heard. At the intersection of all of these uh, disciplines and these approaches is an understanding of bone. And today you're going to hear three quite distinct and unique approaches to the study of uh, bone and bone function. First, you're going to hear from Ted Gross, the director of the Orthopedic Research Lab, about an animal model that has led to uh, remarkable insights into the way bone needs to be stimulated to be both healthy and to develop. Uh, secondly, you're going to hear a, a bone system that has grown completely in a computer program. And again, uh, the, the medium gives its unique insights and unique opportunities to manipulate different aspects of the, the cycle. And finally, I shall talk to you about bone in a novel environment of long duration space travel. So first, I'm pleased to introduce Ted Gross, who will talk on the topic of how often should bone be mechanically loaded for an optimally ana uh, anabolic response. Ted. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. As Peter uh, mentioned, our group in, in the Orthopedic Science Labs is broadly focused in, on bone mechanotransduction. So we're interested in how bone cells sense and respond to physical stimuli and how those um, adaptations result in changes in the morphology of the skeleton. And in particular for today's 15 minutes, I'm going to focus on our efforts over the past almost 12 years now to identify a low magnitude loading regimen, a novel low magnitude loading regimen, that has the potential to be translated into a, a clinical trial to augment bone mass and thereby in at specific skeletal sites and thereby uh, mitigate certain bone loss pathologies. To start with, exercise clearly enhances bone morphology. This has been known for decades. And one of the, the nice examples of this is with uh, the playing and the non-playing arm of tennis players. So Roger Federer, who although he lost in the quarterfinals, still has very much hypertrophy in his right playing arm and has sort of a chicken wing left arm. And we'll start with a little audience interaction at this point. So if you're going to assess how much more bone he has in his playing arm, we have three possibilities. So I'd like you to look at your possibilities and then we'll vote. So how many of you think he has about 1% to 10% more bone in his serving arm? No one. 11 to 20%? And more than 20%. So unanimous vote, uh, including folks from our lab, voted more than 20%. And so uh, rather, we haven't been able to get Roger to come to our lab stick his arm in our nice micro CT scanner, but we used high resolution image processing to analyze that, Photoshop, and it turns out he has 29.2%. And admittedly, this is hypertrophy of his musculoskeletal system, not just his bone, but it's actually very consistent with what other uh, groups have shown, both um, in terms of tennis players, but other single arm racket sports like squash. So there's a huge potential to enhance bone morphology uh, via exercise. So if that's true, why have exercise trials had such limited success? And there's, there's a number of reasons for this, one of which is uh, just the difficulty in translating preclinical information into a clinical study. Um, I think stepping back from that, that general concept and focusing on bone, there are two aspects of how bone responds to mechanical loading that are clearly um, inhibiting the translation of exercise trials into successful uh, mitigation of bone loss pathologies. One is the issue of magnitude. So it turns out that there's a threshold of, of strains of bone deformation that's required to induce an anabolic response, induce bone formation. And that becomes more and more challenging to achieve the older you get. So uh, large magnitude strains, such as if you stood on this, this nice lectern and jumped off, that would be stimulatory for bone adaptation. Walking back to the bathroom would not be stimulatory for bone adaptation. So if you're going to do take a, a population group like my mother, who's nearing 75 years old, and have her do jumping off the table, we're going to be visiting for a hip prosthesis, not augmenting bone mass. So that's a general limitation. Another problem is that the tissue rapidly perceives the mechanical stimulus and then stops responding. So this, in terms of uh, saturation theory, this means that, that after just a few loading cycles, bone's response to loading shuts off. So this is a seminal study from Clint Rubin's group over 25 years ago. And 
um, where they uh, looked at what happens if you unload a bone, so that would be zero loading cycles, um, and then progressively load the bone each day for a certain number of loading cycles at the same magnitude, and then measured bone mineral content at each of the time points. And, and the idea was to, to try and identify whether increasing the numbers of cycles of loading would actually augment bone mass. And you can see from the data that, that the difference between three, 36, 360, and 1,800 cycles a day is really nothing. And so the tissue has rapidly responded to the stimulus, and after that, it, it sort of ignores it, and, which is one reason why when you do events like long-distance swimming, um, marathon running, the tissue, the, the skeleton rapidly senses the stimulus and then and basically ignores everything that happens after that. And so that saturation makes it more difficult to do uh, design exercise trials that will augment bone mass in, in a, to a great extent. For uh, these factors have, have made it very difficult to, um, to uh, use low magnitude loading, such as you might do for walking with walking or gardening or gently walking upstairs to uh, be used as, as a stimulus for bone adaptation. And so our approach was, could we figure out a way that would make this low magnitude loading osteogenic? And the idea that germinated a number of years ago in our group uh, drew from references in the neuronal literature where neurons become saturated in their response to stimuli over time, as well as potential mechanotransduction pathways within bone. And we focused on the idea that maybe what's going on is there's just too much information. And if you take away some of that information, it could be a much more osteogenic and beneficial strategy. So in this case, we have uh, different types of uh, loading events, such as you might be walking. You generate force over each loading protocol. And this is happening about one hertz, such as you might do with walking. Uh, but instead of that, which we, this would be termed cyclic loading, instead of that approach, we developed a strategy called rest-inserted loading, or what we call rest-inserted loading, which is, in essence, taking away most of the information and resting between each load cycle with the idea that, just like your small children in class, if you give them information that's different all the time, they tend to focus on that, as opposed to giving them the same thing over time when they start doing other things. So does this strategy work? So the first uh, loading study we did uh, in vivo, uh, set out to test this. And we did this in a mouse lo loading model that we developed in which we're able to apply some very small, non-invasive bending loads to the tibia. And um, we can generated uh, strains that are physiologic for a mouse about uh, fast walking on the tabletop here. And we compared the response of bone to cyclic loading, 100 cycles a day, versus rest inserted loading at 10 cycles a day. So each cycle spaced by 10 seconds. The green that you see is representative of the osteoblast function during the loading experiment. And cyclic loading on the periosteal surface, the outer surface, cyclic loading demonstrated just a very small periosteal adaptation, which is actually no different than the bone sees normally. Whereas rest insert loading with 10 times fewer load cycles demonstrates this very profound osteoblastic response. And in terms of exercise strategies to mitigate bone loss pathologies, we want to focus on the periosteum because laying down bone on the periosteum is where it has its most structural advantage. Following this study up with a series of, uh, different, of experiments, we're looking at periosteal bone formation rate. That's how much bone is forming over a certain period of time, in this case, three weeks. Um, and you can see that the cyclic loading group um, was no different than the contralateral controls. Rest inserted loading was significantly increased. And we bracketed that and found that it took twice the magnitude of cyclic loading and 10 times the loading cycles to generate the same response that we saw with this very benign rest inserted loading stimulus. So that put us in a position to start thinking about, well, maybe this is a potential uh, strategy to build bone mass with much less effort. And so we've uh, proceeded through a whole series of studies that I'll describe very briefly. Um, that have given us a, a, a much more firm understanding of the potential of this strategy. So if rest and start loading is highly osteogenic, does it inhibit saturation, which was one of the issues that we had um, described early on with uh, the problems of exercise strategies to build bone mass. And here, the, we're plotting periosteal bone formation with uh, groups that have been exposed to cyclic loading or rest and start loading for very numbers of cycles a day, loading three times a week for three weeks, uh, all at the same magnitude. And with the cyclic loading, you can see that we don't get a response early on, but then we get a plateau response. And if we continue out to 1,000 cycles or 5,000 cycles, it's the same response. So clearly, this is a saturation response within this range of physiologic stimuli. Uh, 
For rest inserted loading, for the same strain magnitude, you can see that there is no saturation. And that when we, by the time we get up to this 250 cycles a day, we're significantly increased versus all the other groups. So at least within a, a, a range of activity that would encompass about a 30 minute regimen, rest inserted loading does not saturate. That doesn't mean that it doesn't saturate at some point, but for practical purposes, it avoids the issues that we're talking about earlier. What happens with strain magnitude? Well, for, this is a, a similar experiment where we compared cyclic and rest inserted loading, the same number of cycles each day, but with different strain magnitudes. And you can see as uh, with cyclic loading, as you increase the magnitude, you get an increased response. With rest inserted loading, you get a steeper rate of increase. So again, at each given strain magnitude, the rest inserted loading response is larger. Okay, so it's a very osteogenic stimulus. And coming back to trying to think about how we're going to use this in a clinical trial, what are some of the challenges uh, with an exercise intervention? Well, there's two that I didn't talk about that just have to do with the populations that you're addressing. One is that there's genetic variability in terms of how the skeleton responds to loading. So just like there's a genetic variability in response to pharmaceuticals, the, some people will adapt much more readily to mechanical stimuli or the loss of stimuli for that matter. You can test that by uh, um, examining mice that have defects in mechanotransduction. And one such mouse is the C3H mouse, is known to ha demonstrate a very mitigated response to mechanical stimuli. And in this experiment, we applied both cyclic and rest inserted loading to uh, C3H mice and found that at the same strain, strain magnitude, cyclic loading dem demonstrated a, an increase that was not statistically significant, while rest inserted loading was statistically significant. So at least in this model of genetic variability, it has the ability to overcome some of the, the deficits in mechanotransduction. Another difficulty in uh, doing an exercise trial is working with an aged population. And just like many biological systems, bone's ability to adapt diminishes over time. We've done a series of studies with eight very aged mice. So these are two-year-old mice, very senescent. Um, they don't walk around much. They just sort of hang out, uh, watching TV if they could. And the, these mice, again, the same paradigm where we're exposing them to either cyclic loading or rest inserted loading. Cyclic loading was not stimulatory, just as others have shown. <coughs> rest inserted loading was. And I, I would note that the level of rest inserted loading, the level of adaptation is much less than we see in younger animals. So while rest inserted loading in terms of the aging process has the ability to somewhat diminish, uh, somewhat mitigate the, the diminished response to loading, it doesn't compensate, compensate for it completely. So if uh, it, that sort of summarizes almost 10 years of work. And so I wanted to focus the last couple slides on our strategies right now with what we're doing to move from having a lot of information about rest and serve loading being more efficacious than cyclic loading to actually being able to design a clinical trial. And one area that we started, this is work uh, that's been pushed with uh, by two postdocs in our group, Leah Wharton and Ron Kwan. Um, we've been starting to look at the, why this is actually happening in a mechanistic way. And this is a fluid flow experiment that they've developed that generated some very interesting data just in the last two months. So, People have known that if you push fluid over cells, they respond to those physical stimuli. Bone cells respond the same, in very much the same way as endothelial cells. They respond very quickly, and it's used as a model to study early signaling pathways in ways that we can't access in vivo. And in this experiment, uh, Ron and Leah have uh, contrasted three different conditions. So there's a no-flow condition where the cells just hang out. There's continuous flow for 50 minutes where they get the, the nice little massage, water massage. And then there's what we call rest inserted flow or rest flow, where the, there's flow for five minutes, there's 10 minutes of rest, five minutes of flow, et cetera. And the idea was to, uh, the, the timing of this is based on uh, how much fluid flow of this type is required to stimulate very early signaling pathways associated with mechanotransduction in a wide variety of cells, such as CFOS and COX-2. And the idea was to, to do a preliminary assessment of differential gene expression, that is, are, do, does the rest inserted, these rest intervals, cause different types of genes to be regulated in different ways than continuous flow? And there's a whole, this is our data from RT-PCR analysis, plotted um, with cyclic flow normalized to no flow and rest flow normalized to no flow. So the idea is that if all the genes were regulated the exact same for both, they would all line up on the line. The color analysis gives you a sort of an idea of what's actually going on. So blue, not much going on, sort of random uh, changes for both conditions. Black means that uh, for both of the, cyclic, the continuous flow and the rest flow, 
there was upregulation of, the, of these genes. Red represents a sort of an equivalent downregulation. And for us, the most interesting is this whole suite of green factors. And this represents genes that are fairly strongly downregulated with continuous flow. So after a certain period of time, the cells are downregulating these genes. But in rest inserted flow, they're much less downregulated. So they're much closer to normal levels. And that suggests a resistance of secondary signaling pathways that may be the mechanism by which rest inserted loading overcomes the saturation response I've talked about. We've also begun to empirically explore different strategies. And with uh, one of the di primary difficulties of doing exercise uh, strategies with people is, is um, patient compliance and doing the protocols. And so the less you ask them to do, the more likely they will do it. So being couch potatoes, we want to design the exercise regimen that might just take one day a week of 10 minutes instead of five days a week of 45 minutes. And this is a preliminary study with, with our mouth model in which we contrasted how often each week we needed to load to achieve an anabolic response. And we're contrasting once a week cyclic loading, three times a week cyclic loading, once a week rest, and three times a week rest. So this is the contralateral tibia. We're assessing periosteal bone formation. And you can see that once a week cyclic loading doesn't do anything. Three times a week is osteogenic. Once a week rest is equivalently osteogenic. And three times a week is best, but actually is not statistically different from once a week of rest. So what that means in a schematic way is if we're doing, in this case, a three-week experiment where we're, we're assessing bone formation between these intervals between days 10 and 19, we can get the same amount of anabolic, the same amount of juice out of our loading protocol, loading three, t three times in this three-week period with rest inserted loading as we can with nine bouts of cyclic loading. So it suggests a strategy where we could once a week or twice a week, picking out the optimal days, ask people to come in for a few minutes a day and potentially build bone mass in a very specific part of the body depending on the exercise strategy. <clears throat> so just to summarize quickly, there's a number of we believe there's a number of benefits of using this rest inserted loading. Um, one of which is that you can induce an osteogenic response with much lower magnitude. So no more jumping off the lectern. You can actually potentially design something where somebody's intermittently gardening, walking upstairs, uh, or walking in, a, in sort of a funny walkway, I guess. Um, you can achieve that end with many fewer loading cycles. You don't need somebody to stand there and um, do 100 sets of 10 repetitions of some bicep curl. Uh, it could be just 10 bicep curls over a certain period of time, and they can wiggle their arms in between. And we have the potential to exercise less often, which is, has, a potential, has a direct input into, we believe, uh, future patient compliance. So I, just to finish up and then introduce our next speaker, we're sort of using three approaches to help us optimize. It's, 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 I've described focus mostly on our preclinical optimization, where we've done empirical studies that have demonstrated rest and loading is efficacious and then started to optimize that process. We're starting to work on the cellular mechanism for this because we may be able to, by doing that, have a marker to target that allows us to optimize. And then finally, what I haven't talked about, but which the next speaker, Sundar Srinivasan will, is our in silica optimization. And the reality is that there's not, enough, there's not enough time for us in the next 50 years to do all the in vivo experiments that would be necessary to really optimize that. And, and that vast space of possibilities is, is, a, is an area where using in silica approaches has the ability to target our efforts much more uh, effectively and allow us to iterate much more quickly to an optimal trial design. <coughs> I'd like to close by thanking uh, many people in our lab right now and past uh, who have worked on these projects in various ways, um, and in particular the Whitaker Foundation, which funded some of the initial research a long time ago, and NIAMS for their consistent funding of our work in this area over the last decade. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about our explorations uh, of mechanical instruction in the process using uh, computer modeling as a tool. Um, so my goals today are to you know, give you an idea about some of the insights um, and, uh, intu um, and results, exciting results we've got using this approach. And the other goal that I have is to sort of introduce you to a technology, a technique, which can um, enable you to address a number of questions in our field. Um, so about six or seven years ago, <clears throat> we began to explore mechanical construction by reframing the process as a complex adaptive system. Um, beyond chaos theory, 
and beyond the cliche of what complexity means, uh, we were then able to access uh, an emerging wealth of knowledge in the broad literature, popular literature, such as Complexity by Michael Waltrip, At Home in the Universe by Stuart Kaufman, and Turtles, Termites, and Traffic Jams by Michael Resnick, and other more popular books in the recent past, like uh, Tipping Point or um, Wisdom of Crowds. And what, these, uh, what the literature uh, is trying to explore is what's the commonality between complex systems, how do they behave, what are good tools for the analysis so that you can explain complex behaviors and to try and predict what could act, happen in the future in complex systems. So some of the commonalities of these systems are that they happen to be multi-part, uh, which interact over time and space between themselves, their environment, and are adapted by a process of dynamic feedback between themselves and the environment. Um, it turns out that one of the most ideal tools to analyze such systems is a bottom-up tool, and it's called agent-based modeling. And it is a tool which enables you to understand or explain how interactions between local agents, be it molecules, cells, organs, or organisms, leads to emergent global properties at a scale above. Uh, and this tool has been used in a variety of uh, situations, a variety of um, contexts in biology, ecology, anthropology, economics, um, you know, name it. Uh, and you could explore a complex processes in a number of different fields using this technology. We've since used this, te uh, this technique called agent-based modeling to explore bone mechanical construction. But before I get into that, I want to show you a video about how local rules in individuals can lead to really complex uh, outcomes at the level of a collective or a population. So this is a, a screen capture of these arrows which represent birds uh, which are sitting in a pond and they initially try to fly and they start flying in random directions and the idea behind this model is to explore what causes flocking behavior in birds that you've noticed in the wild. So each of these birds follows some very simple rules. Um, the, the rule is that don't collide with your neighbor, that's one. Uh, and the next rule is turn in the, in the same direction as the local average. So a small radius around you, whoever's flying next to you, turn in that direction. So that's the rule. So as you can um, notice, it's just random motion to begin with, but then there's a small transition where more and more birds start to flow in the same direction. Um, <clears throat> and eventually, at the end of this video, they're all flocking in the, you know, in the southern direction, if you will. So this comes about by two simple rules that I spoke about at the level of the individual and at the level of population, something unpredictable happens, which is a flocking behavior. So this happens in the wild, the flocking behavior that is, but we don't know if the individual rules are the rules that the birds follow to form flocks. So we've developed, uh, people have developed hypotheses at the level of individuals to explain flocking behavior, but then you can also challenge these hypotheses by imposing some sort of extrapolative challenges. For example, what happens to this flock? Do these rules, are these hypotheses sufficient to explain the behavior of the flock when a predator happens uh, to show up? Or if a building is placed in the, in the path of these flocking birds, do, the, do these rules, are they sufficient to cause different behaviors in these birds? And if not, the, the technique is modular enough and flexible enough to add on different hypotheses to explain other real world behaviors. So iteratively, this technique allows you to improve or add on hypotheses in order to explain a host of real world behaviors. So in our case, we were interested in applying this technique to study bone mechanical construction. And where to apply this is pretty clear to us. It's the bone cells which do the adaptation. So the where is clear. However, the question of um, when and what to model is not so clear. So mechanical construction unfolds over a vast time scale and there are a number of signaling pathways that are activated during mechanical construction. So the question is what and when to model. Um, so it turns out that in terms of the when, um, it doesn't take a whole lot of mechanical stimuli to get adaptation. For example, if you crack your shin on the coffee table, you get adaptation, and the impulse causing that adaptation for the last days and weeks is a millisecond impact. Um, animal studies have suggested that if you load bone as little as 15 seconds a day for 24, uh, over a 24 hour period, you could get uh, uh, bone strengthening. And also other studies have shown that a single bout of loading, 100 seconds long, a minute and a half, um, causes tissue adaptation, maxes out at five days, and returns to baseline by nine days. So very brief mechanical stimuli causes adaptation. That's clear. So we were able to then refine our thinking to say like, okay, whatever is happening as and when you mechanically load bone must be important 
So we had to refine this idea a little more, and we did an experiment in mice where we subjected animals to a single bout of, a, of either cyclically, cyclically applied loading or a single bout of rest inserted loading. We assayed adaptation responses at day five and day nine. And what we find with cyclic stimuli is that at day five, the, uh, the surface activation um, on, your, um, on your vertical scale is enhanced significantly. And by day nine, it returns back to baseline levels. Uh, in contrast, when animals are exposed to rest insert, a single bout of rest inserted loading, the response at five days is the same, but at nine days, it remains elevated and uh, significantly more than that induced by cyclic stimuli. So what this tells us is that um, events induced as and when you mechanically load bone has the ability to distinguish between very subtle changes in stimuli. So um, whatever signaling candidate we choose to model or look at or investigate further must have these properties. So it turns out that a number of second messengers like cyclic AMP, calcium signaling, et cetera, and cytoskeletal changes occur in this time frame of seconds to minutes. Um, it turns out, however, that calcium signaling in particular is highly responsive to different kinds of mechanical stimuli. For example, when cells are exposed to uh, oscillating or cyclically applied fluid flow, there's a single transient shown, by, uh, shown in the red circle back here. Um, whereas, when cells are exposed to rest inserted fluid flow, there's multiple, multiple transients uh, or peaks um, in blue. Um, so it turns out that uh, all mechanical stimuli known to be oxygenic induce highly specific calcium oscillation to the point where people have started calling them fingerprints, calcium fingerprints. So downstream of this calcium response, a variety of transcription factors are activated and you'd require a factor like that to get into the nucleus, bind to DNA, and then control cell functions like proliferation, differentiation, cell death, and that ultimately leads to tissue adaptation. And it turns out of the many different transcription factors, one acts in, uh, uh, called NFAT, a nuclear factor of activated T cells. Uh, it's an immune factor, which is uh, highly responsive to calcium signals and serves as a memory of calcium signals. So we chose to explore calcium and fat signaling as a candidate pathway for real-time signaling or real-time signaling events. So having identified the when and the what, we started to apply this understanding to an in silico model. Um, the where was the next question. Where is obvious, it's in the bone cells. So to get at the bone cell population, we imaged cross-section from the mutant tibia mid-shaft, um, and we looked at how the cells are connected to each other and came up with this network of in silico bone cells. And to this network, the red dot signifies one single cell uh, in the network. We applied our biophysical model where calcium oscillations um, out here emerges as an interplay between strain-induced influx of calcium and strain occurs when we load the bone, um, then calcium influx into the cell through functionally connected neighbors in that localized neighborhood, and a dumping or release of calcium from internal stores. And downstream of this calcium fluctuation, you have activation of this transcription factor, or dephosphorylation in this case, of NFAT. And when it gets into the nucleus, in surface cells, it causes mineral apposition and bone formation. Um, so taken together, we've managed to image mid-shaft tibia, come up with an in silico network of cells, impose this model in each cell in this network, and, provide, and obtain calcium oscillations, uh, transcription factor dynamics, and therefore osteoblastic mineral apposition by every single osteoblast on the bone surface. And taken together, you get bone adaptation as shown here in the green, and as Ted showed you in the slides earlier. Like the, when I showed you the bird flocking video, there's, very, uh, there's two parameters to tune, so you can hand tune these parameters. But in this model, it's a little more complicated. Still simple compared to the biology, but a little more complicated mathematically. So we had to calibrate the model. We don't know what the parameters are, and they're impossible to measure experimentally because they, uh, all these signaling pathways are activated within seconds and minutes inside bone. So you can't peek in and see how these things are, are, are unfolding. So instead, we took the approach of sort of reverse engineering where we have this pathway activated within cells, but we have a lot of data at the tissue level. So we train the model with tissue level data to determine what the parameters ought to be. So we did this for data that we derived in both young and old animals exposed to a variety of mechanical stimuli. And as you can tell, the model, after a bunch of calibration, which took about six months of computational time, we were able to get to a point where uh, the model with tuning can simulate data in young and in old, but with different tuned parameters. And I'll come to that a little later. So 
what this tells us is that a simple model of signaling events activated within seconds can simulate adaptation, which occurs three weeks later. So our model is sufficient to explain the data we already have. So the next challenge is to see if the model can do anything more than just explain what the data we already have. So, the, so that's imposing some challenges to the model and testing with our hypothesis to hold up later on. So then we said, okay, can we, can we use this model to optimize uh, bone adaptation in both young and in old animals? So uh, as a first step, we did this in young animals and we asked a question, can we optimize a 30 minute workout? So typically when you do a workout and, you, and you're lifting weights every one second, it, it, it results in about 1800 load cycles. Um, and when we did the simulation to optimize this protocol, uh, it suggested to us that loading bone just four times within a 30 minute workout with a 10 minute rest between load cycles could get you as much or more site specific bone adaptation compared to 1800 cycles. So we, uh, the simulation suggested that with 1800 cycles of loading, um, you can get a certain amount of bone formation, which will be enhanced with four cycles with 10 minute rest. So given this rather provocative uh, optimization um, you know, insight, we did the experiment in animals, and we found that not only does the model, uh, I mean, does the in vivo data corroborate the model's prediction, but the fact is that you get a two-fold increase in bone formation with a f less than 400 fold uh, um, loading effort, if you will. So this is exciting from in, t in two perspectives. One is that it again points out or confirms that our internal hypothesis, the way we've implemented the model, is okay, not so bad. And secondly, it suggests that you know you could get more uh, bone adaptation with substantially less loading effort if you do it right. So this is important from the standpoint that, as uh, Ted mentioned, in clinical trials, a major problem. Um, with lack of efficacy of clinical trials, exercise trials, is the fact that people are not able to comply, both very young and very old people are not able to comply with the type of strenuous activity required for bone adaptation. So if you can get away with doing less, that could be a really important strategy um, if you work out right. Um, so given, given the fact that we've sort of answered this question in young animals and in, young, uh, in the young skeleton, we decided to see if the model can help us um, optimize adaptation in the senescent skeleton. So for this, we went back to the model. And I remember I told you that we had to tune the model differently to explain the data in young versus old. Uh, the hypotheses remain the same, it's just the settings of the parameters are different. So we then went back to the model and decided to see what is different about the tuned parameters. And it turns out that two of the parameters, one controlling how calcium activates this transcription factor, and fat, and the other about how this factor binds to DNA, those are the two factors which are degraded by aging. And it turns out that this is similar to what people have seen in literature, in experimental studies, in cells. Um, so the other issue was like our, our modeling, our simulations also suggested that if you can somehow restore these deficits, you could double adaptation in bone in the senescent skeleton. So given this finding, we then went back to the literature and looked at agents uh, adjuvants which we could use, which could directly uh, possibly address these deficits in signaling. Uh, and it turns out that cyclosporin happens to be one uh, such target, uh, one such agent uh, when used at low dosages. So given the literature, um, uh, given our st uh, a study of literature, we did an experiment where we exposed animals, uh, both young and old, to mechanical stimuli. And the young skeleton responds really robustly to our applied protocol whereas the response uh, to the same protocol calibrated equivalently in senescent mice, which is, by the way, the human equivalent of a 75-year-old person, um, is much more blunted. So when these animals were mechanically loaded but supplemented with uh, CSA, you get an a, a enhanced bone adaptation response more than twofold, and which is equivalent to what we observed in young. So in effect, we found that with low-dose cyclosporin supplementation, you could rescue bone adaptation at senescence to levels observed in young. So this is again important from the standpoint, from a couple of different standpoints. So uh, our discovery here is again a very extrapolative, uh, is in response to a very extrapolative challenge to the model. So again, the data here suggests that our internal hypotheses in the model is sufficient to overcome this challenge that we imposed on it. Uh, the other thing that we're excited about is that cyclosporin is already approved and at the low dosages that we're using uh, can be extremely, extremely inexpensive uh, as an adjuvant therapy for trials in, in the elderly. Um, so there's a couple of things that we're excited about in, the, in that frame. 
So taken together, by simply reframing uh, adaptation, bone adaptation as a complex adaptive phenomenon, we've been able to take advantage of this technique called agent-based modeling and uh, create computer models of how mechanical construction might function in bone. And by coupling it to in vivo experiments and doing it iter iteratively, we've been able to come up with strat strategies which optimize adaptation in both the young and in the senescent skeleton. So I think in a few years' time, we'd be hopefully planning some pilot studies in humans. And given the data from those studies, we are sort of hoping or you know, fairly certain that we can couple those data, the pilot study data, with our in, in silico models to come up with a way to explain human data as opposed to animal data. And if we can get there, then we're pretty confident of using that strategy iteratively along with um, a larger trial in humans, in both young and old, to optimize adaptation uh, with uh, very mild stimuli, with or without adjuvants. Um, I hope I've sort of given you a picture of the sort of insights that we've gained using this technique of agent-based modeling. Uh, and given how versatile and modular it is, I think there's, there could be a plenty of opportunities um, to collaborate amongst us uh, to address and think about and really uh, give life to a number of your ideas and hypotheses in the in silico realm um, about a number of uh, problems in our field of orthopedics and sports medicine. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, members of our lab who've contributed to this research in many different ways, our collaborators and our funding sources. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So from uh, the computer memory, we now go to space. And space offers a quite unique opportunity to study bone adaptation because it's the rare event when we can completely unload the skeleton and see its response to programmed stimulation. Mission durations in the history of space flight uh, have allowed different opportunities to study bone. The space shuttle, the longest mission, was only 17.4 days. And so although there was tremendous loss of muscle during this time, there was not much change in bone. However, the Mir space station, the most successful space station that's ever been launched, the longest mission from a single individual was 437.7 days. And that certainly was enough to see some rather dramatic changes and adaptations in bone. The International Space Station, the longest mission, has been 215 days. And this is the platform that we have had an opportunity to study bone adaptation. And I'm going to give you some background to bone loss in space, tell you one experiment we've done in space, and one complementary experiment we've done on Earth. In contrast to the longest duration so far, 400 uh, uh, plus days, the mission to Mars will require, depending upon how we go, most likely we will leave to join the Mars orbit, stay on Mars for a complete orbit, and then come back, it will be 30 months. And so that is five times the longest experience on the International Space Station that we've had. So Mars is really unknown territory for bone. Now, what do we know about how bone is lost in space? As a, uh, a benchmark, I want to show you here, this graph has been drawn bone loss, bone mineral density loss per month uh, on the axis. And here you see the loss on that scale that a postmenopausal woman experiences in a single month. We know that postmenopausal osteoporosis is a significant problem. Here, on the same scale, are the changes that occur per month in space. And I want to draw your attention to the change in the greater trochanter, proximal femur, and the change in the arm. You notice there is about 1.5% per month loss in the greater trochanter, 10 times as much as a postmenopausal woman loses, but no loss in the upper extremity. So this is not a systemic loss. This clearly is somehow functionally mediated. Now, Lang's work using QCT, the last data I showed you was from DEXA, has showed us that if we look at the two compartments in the femoral neck, the cortical compartment and the trabecular compartment, there is a dramatically increased loss of trabecular bone compared to cortical bone. The same is true in the trochanter, but not so in the spine, where there is loss, uh, but uh, no significant difference between the spine, trabecular, and cortical. These changes in bone mineral density have important implications for loss in strength. And the work of Joyce Keck and her colleagues has shown that the strength of the proximal femur in stance 
is decreased at a rate of about 2.5, 2.6% per month, the fall strength at 2% per month. And what this shows is that the loss in strength is twice the loss of bone mineral density. So the worry is that an astronaut would be on the moon, on Mars, they would have lost sufficient strength to fracture doing routine exploration tasks. So in summary, if we consider this diagram to show what happens to a postmenopausal woman per month, a loss of approximately 0.15%, and that it occurs in the spine, the uh, proximal femur, and the wrist at about the same magnitude. In an astronaut, there is no loss in the upper extremity. There is significant loss in the proximal femur and less loss in the spine. But in every case, it's much more dramatic than occurs in osteoporosis on Earth. We don't know the time course, but there is every expectation that the time course will follow the similar time course that occurs in people who have a spinal cord injury. And that is that there is rapid loss until an asymptotic region is reached about four years post uh, lesion. And so travelers to Mars will still be in this region here of steep bone loss while they are performing tasks in uh, the gravity of Mars. Now what about recovery on coming back to Earth? Subonga has studied the loss. There is an astronaut long duration health study where astronauts come back each year for bone scans. And you can see that in different regions, the gain after about 200 to 300 days, this is the, the half return. 50% is recovered after about 240 days in the proximal femur. So there is another issue to this, that astronauts are at risk for injury when they return to Earth because of the slow recovery of bone mineral density. Finally, another very interesting adaptation occurs that the same amount of bone mass is distributed further away from the central axis, similar to the observation in aging by Riggs. And so the femur is actually altered in astronauts who've flown in space to adapt the, the, the same amount of bone mineral to a larger volume, giving the same mechanical strength. Now what about mechanisms? Typically the close tied relationship between bone formation and bone resorption occurs on Earth, but in space, it's been found that there is increased bone resorption. A number of studies have, have shown this. It seems to be, because this is not a, a systemic factor, that this is relating to loading. And this is a schematic of the, the work on the mechanostat that was proposed over 25 years ago. And here you see that there's a region of loading where you get neither bone gain or bone loss. But if you go beyond the region in the negative loading, you get significant bone loss, and you can get significant hypertrophy at the other end of the spectrum. And so we had the opportunity to study what actual loading goes on during activity in space. This is the equipment that we actually developed and flew to space uh, aboard the space shuttle, and we prepositioned it on the International Space Station. We also had to train all the astronauts who used it, because in space, the astronauts are not only your subjects, they are the experimenters. And so you can imagine many hours of complex training to get astronauts to, uh, to deploy and use this equipment. I want to point your attention out of all this to these devices here, which are force measuring insoles that were worn inside the shoes for complete days. Here you see the commander of, of Mission 4, Ken Bowersox, um, who during a day on Earth, this is a complete day of loading, this is the magnitude of the force in those sensors that I showed you, there is sporadic loading all through the day on Earth and a long period of walking and running at the end of the day. At the same scale on space, and here he is wearing the equipment, you see that there's virtually nothing happening for most of the day as far as loading is concerned until he does some treadmill work and resistance exercise at the end of the day. Here you see Bowersox running on a treadmill. The only way you know it's in space is because this treadmill is floating. That's the way it's uh, isolated from the vehicle. And here you see him with the equipment on. These are our sensors. This is our data recorder. And the, uh, the, the foot uh, sensors are in his feet. Now when we looked at the data and compared what happens during exercise in space to what happens on Earth. Let's look at the running data. This is running and this is the peak magnitude of the forces under the feet. 
You notice that in zero G, the forces that he experienced during running were about 40% less than the forces that he experienced during the same activity on, uh, uh, on Earth. Now, what about duration? You often hear that astronauts do two hours of exercise a day. That is actually not the case. They have two hours programmed for exercise, but by the time everything is put in place and they adjust all the equipment and they dress, they only get about 45 minutes average of exercise a day, and so that exercise period is only 30% efficient. So we have long periods without loading, we have exercise loading that is less than exercise on Earth, and we have exercise duration that is inadequate. And that combines to reduce the stimulus to bone and cause the losses that you have seen. We have done another experiment on Earth where we were able to persuade volunteers to go to bed for 84 days um, in a six degree head down tilt. And that is to, stim to simulate the change in volume that occurs during the, uh, uh, during the space flight. I know that there are some residents who would feel that 84 days in, in bed is a very attractive proposition at this point since you haven't seen bed for a long time. Um, the control group had no exercise whatsoever. They lay in bed all day long, 84 days. The exercise group were wheeled out daily, maintained horizontal, and we replaced their daily load, which we had measured before they went to bed. And we did that on this vertical treadmill. And so here you see a treadmill where they are suspended with gravity replacing springs. And this device here applies the gravity to them through a uh, waist belt and a chest harness. So they exercised intermittently five times a week during the whole period of 12-week bed rest. If we look at the change in bone mineral density in different regions, here you see, let's look at the total hip, the control group lost about 5% of their total bone mass in the hip, whereas the exercising group maintained and actually increased by 1.14% during their time in bed. I should add that these were sedentary subjects before they went to bed because we figured if we cannot stop bone loss in sedentary subjects, we're never going to be able to stop it in people who are habitually active. So if, contrary to what's being done on the space station presently, that you exercise them with adequate loads, adequate duration related to their own habitual activity, it seems very promising that you can reduce the bone loss that currently is limiting spaceflight. Now, an obvious question is, well, what about the use of osteoprotective drugs? There are millions of men and women who are taking bisphosphonates and other drugs. LeBlanc has shown in a bed rest study similar to ours that uh, aledronate will attenuate bone loss in uh, male subjects during 17 weeks of horizontal bed rest. There is also a non-orbit experiment presently in progress where presently three astronauts have taken uh, uh, bisphosphonates. However, there is considerable concern amongst the astronaut corps of the use of bisphosphonates in young, young individuals. Uh, there have been, of course, cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw in very isolated cases, and some of the astronauts have actually been refused dental care uh, if they had used uh, bisphosphonates. However, there are some very promising new drugs, with, uh, such as uh, uh, denosumab, which was approved in 2010, uh, and this has shown to be uh, remarkably efficacious for preventing bone. And perhaps most interesting of all is sclerostin gene deletion, which has been shown in mice which are tail suspended, which is another model of non-weight bearing. It, they have, it's completely inhibited bone loss in these mice. So in conclusion, a report from the National Academy of Science recently published says that without appropriate countermeasures, Space flight of two years or longer will present serious risks due to progressive bone fragility unless some of these countermeasures that I have shown you are implemented. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a tremendous team of people who have had work with me on these experiments and funding from uh, NASA and from the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Thank you very much.